All right. Uh, our next presentation sure. is going to be given by uh, Dr. Rudder. I think and I'm happy to do okay. the introduction while we switch over the PowerPoints. So actually, uh, we ask counsel frequently, who do you want to hear from? What visitors, what presenters can we bring to a future council meeting? And our speaker today is somebody that was uh, suggested, in fact, by you. And so we um, are delighted that we have Joni Rudder here today. Uh, Joni is the director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or otherwise known as NCATS. In this role, she oversees the planning and execution of the center's complex multifaceted programs that aim to overcome scientific and operational barriers, impeding the development and delivery of new treatments and other health solutions. Now, prior to joining NCATS, uh, Joni served as the director of scientific programs within the All of Us Research Program, where she led the scientific programming development and implementation efforts to build a national research cohort, as I told you about in my director's report. Uh, Joni has been a leader in NIH in enhancing community engagement and inclusion of underrepresented groups in biomedical research for many years. She spearheads multiple efforts to enhance diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility among the NCAT staff and the broader translational science workforce and efforts uh, that she also leads to reduce health disparities through translational science approaches. She's not a stranger to genetics or genomics because her expertise um, and personal experiences include clinical research in human genetics and environmental risk factors focusing on the fields of cancer and addiction. And throughout her career, she's earned many national and international um, uh, recognition for her diverse and unique, unique expertise. And her taking over as the director of NCATS is certainly going to be a continuation of a great relationship uh, that we have had between NHGRI and NCATS uh, since its inception. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Joni. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, this is my favorite IC. I mean, I mean, second to NCATS, but uh, it is one of my favorites. And so it's an honor to be here today. I'm going to talk, uh, as Eric mentioned, about the intersection of, of translational science and genomics. But before I get diving into that, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how, how I do talks like this. So I have a QR code showing there on the left. This is just to, to get you started because I use a lot of QR codes over the course of the presentation. Um, I found that over Zoom, it's easier for people to just follow along that way and, and dive into more information in case you're interested. So this one gives you a sense of, of who we are and what we do at NCATS. It takes you to our website. And then I also wanted to highlight two of our eight translational science badges because when I thought about this presentation and I thought about the work that we do with NHGRI, these two uh, translational science principles of the eight total that we have really come to mind for me when we work with NHGRI. One is team science. We have a variety of multidisciplinary approaches in the work that we do to produce research that advances the translational science along the, the research spectrum. And then the other one is bold and rigorous. So when I think about the work that we do with NHGRI, especially when it comes to diagnostics and therapeutics uh, using genomics, I think of bold and rigorous approaches of how we're approaching that. And, and so these are the two things that really come to mind over the course of, of my interactions with NHGRI over the course of about 20 years now, actually, and still going strong. Um, and so I hope to highlight some of these uh, principles as we go forward through the presentation so you can really see what I'm talking about in some of the, this work. But the work that NCATS does is in part made possible because of the work NHGRI has done and is continuing to do. And together we're discovering the healing process and the healing power of genomics through diagnostics and therapeutics. And I'm hoping to give you a sense of that today. But before I dive into even that, I wanna take a moment and, and just give a hearty big congrats to Eric. Your vision, your dedication, your contributions in genomics and medicine are beyond worthy of this honor. So well-deserved, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, you should clap, although you're virtual, yeah. Uh, and even though the council members are, are virtual, it's still very heartfelt. Um, that, that was not a requirement for you, uh, to, okay, for you to come talk yeah. today. Just and sure. by the way, enough about you. We're going to move on. <laughs> no, it is a big honor, so, so congrats. All right, so uh, NCATS. When I start talking about NCATS, I want to start off by talking about the public health challenge that we are facing. We're all facing this. And, and um, NCATS is not the only institute or center that, that doesn't really have an organ or a system that we focus on. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we really focus on over the, all 10,000 diseases out there. And so that's, that's definitely part of our remit. 
Now, the reason we do that is because there are only 5% of those diseases that have treatments or cures. So there's a long way to go here. 95% of diseases out there don't have treatments or cures. And the challenges here are that the time it takes to develop a therapeutic from even from the, the target discovery through IND or first in human, it takes about 10 to 15 years. And then even after that for the clinical phases, it takes another 10 to 15 years. So this is a long time, high cost, and, and uh, fraught with a variety of issues. Not only that, the percentage of drugs entering clinical trials results, that results in an approved medicine is less than 12%. So nine out of 10 times, these therapeutics actually fail in clinical trials. And so these are two really big bottlenecks that NCATS is here to try to help address. So our mission is to turn research observations into health solutions by doing translational science. And with that, we've generated three audacious goals. We wanna bring more treatments, and that is to move that 5% up to 25% in the next 10 years. So a five-fold increase in the number of diseases with treatments. More treatments for all people, so dramatically increase inclusivity across every area that we support, not just from workforce development, but also social determinants of health and uh, anything in between to ensure that we're being inclusive in the work that we do. And this is at every phase of the preclinical and clinical translational pipeline. So more treatments for all people, and then the third one is more quickly. We want to enable diagnostics and therapeutics to reach people at least twice as fast. So these are our audacious goals that we're trying to address through, through the uh, translational science that, that we do. So NCATS is uh, advancing translational science by what we call addressing the operational and the scientific bottlenecks in the translational pipeline so that new treatments can reach people faster. And if you think about it actually as a pipe, um, you know that if you have a, a pipe, that if there are things in the pipe that are blocking the flow rate, then that flow rate is dictated by the, the, uh, how big that, that blockage is. And so we want to go in and we want to tackle all of these different areas, whether they be scientific or operational, but those bottlenecks are really important for us to tackle so that we can enable things to move along that translational pipeline faster. So this is about um, the translational science, but when we do translational science to tackle those bottlenecks, we often do translational research projects because that enables us the ability to work on specific diseases or projects and understand where those bottlenecks are so that we can get a handle on, on tackling them. So we do this in a variety of different ways. We have four main approaches. We want to understand what's similar across diseases to spur multiple treatments at a time. We develop models that better predict a person's reaction to treatment. And then we enhance clinical trials so they more accurately reflect the, the, the patient populations that we're trying to address. This is a big one here, so there's a lot really under that hood. Um, and, then, and then lastly, to leverage real world data and data science approaches to address public health needs. So these are our really four key sort of pillars that we use to address uh, translational science pipeline and, and address those bottlenecks within them. So I'm gonna to talk today about uh, uh, sort of three different vignettes that I think will highlight um, how we're addressing these bottlenecks and, and, and why the work that we do together is so important. But number one is to, uh, I'll, I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, using better predictive models than the ones that we currently have for diseases. And then the next one I'll talk about rare diseases. We, we don't study a particular disease or organ system, but we emphasize actually rare diseases. There are over 10,000 diseases. Actually, there are over 10,000 rare diseases. Um, so, so this is a pretty big umbrella for us. Um, and then I'll talk about gene targeted therapies. And then lastly, I'll touch upon our data science work and, and, and our big flagship program called the, the Clinical and Translational Science Awards Program um, and some of the work that we've been doing in the pandemic that we hope to sort of expand into other areas as well. So with that, I'll start off with better predictive models. And um, as you, as you know, when, we're, when we do uh, drug development work, we often have used 2D cell lines or rodent models to to recapitulate what we might see in humans. Well, we do have a 90% failure rate, as it turns out, in that. And so maybe the models that we're using actually aren't very good at predicting um, how a drug is going to interact with the body. Um, and so we're interested in, in, in thinking about how to bring that relevance to more of the human condition by human, using human-based uh, cell, cell lines or, cell, or physiological relevant cells to then create spheroids or organoids, printed tissues, and organs on a chip. 
Now, the issue that we encounter with, with doing this work is that as you increase the physiological complexity in the work that, that's shown here, um, you actually decrease your ability to do it faster. Um, so we want to try to find a balance of how we can create the, the, the flexibility of, of high throughput screening with the, the really need for the physiological complexity that we're looking for. So this is one of the challenges that we're, we're addressing now. So uh, one of the ways that we do this is by using induced pluripotent stem cells because we can take stem cells from, from people uh, relatively easily and then redifferentiate re them into different uh, uh, terminal cells and to create uh, cell lines to, to use in research purposes and then put them on these types of models, whether they be uh, tissues on a chip or, or, or uh, 3D bioprinted cells or even multiple organs on a chip. And so I've actually brought a, a certain one today. I don't know if you can, I don't know where the camera is, but I brought one of these chips here today. Um, it's th this size and it's actually uh, showing the lung model here on the, on the image. And this is, uh, this is a lung on a chip, but the, the material that's used to make this chip is actually bendable. And the reason for that is so that you can actually uh, pull a vacuum in there to stretch the cells out and then contract them together, just like recapitulating uh, lungs when you're breathing. And so the material that you can use on these chips is, is, is quite important, as it turns out. And then this is an, uh, uh, an example of a kidney on a chip with vascular um, uh, cells as well. And then, Hold on, you can see exactly what they're seeing. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, oh, yeah. thank you. Oh, that's not, not too bad. Okay, I'll step out of the way. Uh, <laughs> so, so this is a multi-organ on a chip, and, and this one here has um, cardiac cantilever, skeletal muscle cantilever, cardiac microelectrodes arrays, and, and motor neurons. Um, so, so this is kind of what they look like. They're the size of a credit card or so, but they're very valuable in helping us address then what these models could be and how we can re recapitulate uh, uh, basically humans on a chip. And you can imagine that someday we might actually get to a U on a chip, uh, a precision medicine-based approach. If, if perhaps we need to do a clinical trial, uh, we could use your cells instead of you until we understand how that, that medication is going to be used. So this is a really new technology and, and we're very excited for it. Um, now, uh, we, we have been partnering in NASA for a long time, and so partnerships are really important for us. Everything we do is, is in partner with someone. And in this case, uh, we've been partnering with, with NASA for the last 10 years in order really to make the chips kind of these, this, this small. Um, they started out quite big, like a desktop computer, um, but working with the NASA engineers, we were them very small. And, and our work with NASA also was inspiring because we knew that astronauts, when they would go into space, they would experience muscle wasting, bone loss, kidney problems, sleep issues, and all of these things over the course of their stay in space. Now, luckily, when they returned back to Earth, they would, uh, that those processes would reverse and actually go back to normal. But still, because they were experiencing this, this gave us the idea that if we sent these kinds of tissue chips into space, then perhaps we could learn about what's happening in the microenvironment on these cells. And so we've been doing this for the last two years. And this is one of the, the, uh, the launches that we had back in March. Uh, it was a night launch, it was uh, on, the, on the SpaceX. Uh, but we sent two heart tissue chips up into space to learn about different um, uh, medications that are used to treat uh, cardiac issues. And then another one to look at, at sort of uh, decay over time and heart function in the microgravity environment. So there have been a lot of advances made by developing these early generation tissue chips, but they aren't enough. So we need to up our game. And, uh, and luckily, over the course of the last year, there has been an advisory council, or advisory committee to the director that has been meeting to talk about catalyzing the development and use of novel approach methodologies. That's a fancy term for what these tissue chips are. Um, these are novel approach methodologies. And, and their charge was to identify alternative methods to um, uh, think about how to in, enhance our ability to study human biology, circuit systems, and, and a variety of disease states. And over the course of that year, they came up with a variety of different uh, um, recommendations that are shown here on the right. Um, but essentially, the main ones for us are, are the, they're all very important, but the two ones at the top are to prioritize the development and use of these combinatorial noms, so not just the tissue chips, but can we can we um, partner them with other kinds of data, like in silico methods or 
um, in chemical methods and, and in addition to the in vitro methods. And so we want to develop these a little bit more and perhaps use them in combination with one another and then establish a, a robust infrastructure and collaborations to really promote the use of these as a more of an interoperable, reliable, and uh, high quality data sets that, that can really help us do research going further. So um, if you want more information on this, please see the QR code. But um, after the, the uh, convening of this group, they, they ended their time in, in December, and we had been busily writing uh, uh, an idea for a common fund program called Complementary, um, Complement Animal Research in Experimentation. Um, I, that's not as tortured usually as they are, but, but it's, a, it's a nice way to say and convey exactly what we're trying to do. We don't think we're gonna be able to replace animal models. That's not really the goal. Our goal though is to understand how we can complement them and where it might be reasonable to think about replacing them. So we just received approval to initiate this Common Fund program and it, it, it will uh, sort of further those ACD recommendations that I mentioned before by accelerating the development standardization, validation, regulatory development, for example, and how we can use these new methods and approaches that will more accurately reflect the human biology and complement then those, those traditional animal models. So this is, be on the lookout for this. We're just starting, no um, initiatives are yet out. We have done a challenge competition, but um, the initiatives are, will, will generally be starting towards the end of this year. So now I wanna move into another area of the uh, rare disease uh, clinical research network and gene therapy work that we've been doing. Um, and uh, this is, a, a sort of should start off at a higher level here. Um, the reason rare diseases are so important and we think of them really as a public health need. And the reason for that is because we did a, a study a few years ago that, that looked at rare diseases, uh, actually 14 specific rare diseases and it, we picked 14, even though there are a lot of rare diseases, we picked 14 because we were able to find them in the electronic health record databases consistently. Many others we can't find consistently in electronic health records. That's a problem for another day. We can talk Ian's about that. Um, but uh, so we took, we took a look at 14 rare diseases that were, that were more common in the electronic health records. We compared the individuals who had a rare disease to individuals who didn't have a rare disease. And it turns out, that individuals with a rare disease um, had three to five times higher medical care costs than those who don't have a rare disease. And so when you compare that to the number of people with a rare disease, which numbers in about 30 million in this country and about 400, uh, 400 million globally, well, that's a pretty big number. It turns into $400 billion per year in medical care costs for those with rare diseases. Now, if you add on to that, then the indirect costs, um, the indirect medical care costs or the indirect costs that are associated with perhaps altering your homes or vehicles to accommodate someone with a rare disease, you know, those costs really start to, to add up. And when you include those, it's up to a trillion dollars per year in, in total costs for rare diseases. So this is a very big public health burden because the economic burden is so high, the biological burden is so high. So this is a, a, something that we're trying to address um, uh, in a very robust way. We have something called the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, which is really the flagship program, I would say, for the rare disease community. Um, this is a network of over 20 different research teams collaborating to achieve you know, really faster diagnoses and also uh, in increase um, natural history studies and, and therapeutic approaches for rare diseases. For any individual award, they have to look at at least three different uh, diseases within that award. The mean is about nine diseases for, for, for a, a given award, so, so they do look at more than one disease at a time. And in general, they do five to, uh, three to five clinical studies or natural history studies, biomarker studies, or, or clinical trials, for example. And they also have to have career enhancements and, and, and have an engagement and dissemination arm. But I think the most disruptive aspect of the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network is actually the patient advocacy groups. They are also a requirement within the award. And the patient advocacy groups uh, started out relatively small, usually a couple of, 
of patient advocacy groups per ward, but now they're in the hundreds. Um, so it's really grown over time, and it is they are indispensable in, in terms of the work that, that we do. It really brings that patient community to the clinical uh, research community together to advance the science faster. And so the PAGs, for example, they participate in research by recruiting for studies. They foster study participation from diverse patient groups. They educate and train um, other groups and even financially back some of the work that gets done. Um, and, and so I think that this is a, a really critical piece of, of what we do at the RDCRN. And so I wanted to highlight that here for you today. The other component here is sort of the impressive work that they have uh, conducted over the course of uh, uh, about 20 years now. Um, there have been uh, four instantiations of the Rare, Rare Disease Network uh, Consortium over the last 20 years, and we're just initiating our fifth. So stay tuned if you're interested in, in joining or, or applying for the, those awards. Um, but to date, uh, over the course of these awards, the rare disease impact has pr been pretty high. The infrastructure that is built along with that allows us to have uh, partnerships and, and do associated clinical trials as well that may not necessarily be funded through one of these awards, but the infrastructure allows it. And so with that, we have been able to have eight FDA-approved treatments for nine different rare diseases, and we're continuing to count, of course, and hope to see that number um, increase over time. So, so that's the real workhorse behind the rare disease community. And I want to just talk a moment, too, about the importance of the, the, the diagnostic side as well. And one of the key innovations that we're working on here is uh, to think about using electronic health records to and, and artificial intelligence to actually identify people in the electronic health record systems better, faster, and cheaper. As I said, it was really hard to find rare diseases. We could do it confidently and reliably reliably with 14, but with all over 10,000 of them, how do we find these individuals in the electronic health record? So this is one of the reasons that this particular program is so important for us. Um, for example, uh, one group is looking at electronic health records. They're going in to identify the existing rare disease patients, and then they're developing um, uh, AI models to, to then um, understand how we can identify other rare disease patients who have not yet been diagnosed. And if those algorithms are robust and good, then, then we'll validate those in other settings and well, as well to try to disseminate that effort. So this is one of those areas where AI is so important for finding things that we can't find in, in systems like these. Um, another opportunity here is, is um, there are groups looking at machine-assisted approaches for finding neurodevelopmental disorders much more readily. Um, these are uh, very devastating diseases, and so finding them earlier gives us a better opportunity for mo modifying, those modifying those diseases with therapies. And then lastly, we have a virtual platform for genetics evaluation in the medically underserved. Um, this is a, this is a, a group in, in Texas who is working in the Rio Grande Valley to uh, use telehealth, telemedicine, to work with rare disease patients and even do genomic sequencing for those who are severely ill and to learn about that and how to implement that kind of care in those uh, primary uh, care uh, institutions. Um, so, so these are some of those areas that we're getting into in terms of the diagnostics. And then I want to spend a little bit of time here on developing and streamlining delivery approaches for gene therapy. So on the therapeutic side, um, I wanted to highlight uh, uh, gene editing approaches that we're doing with a common fund program called the Somatic Cell Gene Editing Program. The Accelerated Medicines Program, or um, the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, or BGTC. And then more closely to the clinical trials, um, this one's fairly close to a clinical trial. This is the Platform Vector Gene Therapy, or PAVE-GT program. And all of these are on the course to go to gene ther or go to clinical trials, but, but they're, uh, some are further away than others. But the reason that this is so important is because uh, gene therapies are, one, or we hope, one-time therapies for individuals that can dramatically help uh, people with very severe um, uh, genetic diseases. So this is an example of aromatic L amino acid decarboxylase, or AADC. Uh, children with this deficiency range in the number of 4,000 4, to 6,000, um, and their life expectancy is about four to eight years. It's an incredibly devastating uh, disease. And uh, we were part of a program that 
first marketed the gene therapy and, and through a direct infusion into the, the brain, into the putamen area. This was a collaboration with uh, Agilis Therapeutics at the time, as well as the National Taiwan University in 2016. And NCATS's role was to develop the GMP grade manufacturing processes and the GLP safety uh, evaluations to ensure that this was safe uh, to, to put into patients. And so we did so uh, around that time in 2016. And you can see the, the child on the, on the upper left there on the bottom side of the screen um, is, is earlier, around four years old at that point in time, prior to treatment with the gene therapy. And then after gene therapy, after the five years of evaluation, you can see that child at, its, uh, at their 10th birthday um, upright and sitting. And so the, the, the real value in seeing this is, is, is incredible. The issue with these gene therapy uh, programs, however, is that they're one-offs. And so our goal is to really kind of address that, that therapeutic pipeline idea by um, thinking about the delivery side and not necessarily worrying about any particular gene. That will come, of course, but if we can think about the delivery, how to get this into the, the, the patient's uh, specific uh, tissues and, and organs and cells, um, at, a, at a dose that will affect the disease, that's what we're really looking for. So these three programs, the somatic cell gene editing program is a common fund program. It's in its second phase. So we're just starting the second uh, five-year program here. The first phase was focused on uh, technology development and looking at, at, at uh, uh, small animal models as well as large animal models. And now in the second phase, we're going to be moving more towards the clinical uh, trial efficacy by doing IND enabling studies and of course continuing the assay development work as well. So this will be very important as we move forward, so stay tuned. Um, for the Accelerated Medicines Partnership Program, the BGTC, um, I want to just highlight on the right-hand side that, that this is a, a large group of NIH colleagues, including NHGRI, a lot of industry partners and nonprofit and organizations. It is particularly about their fear of commitment. As well. Sorry, that wasn't me. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, but our, our goal here, too, is to enhance vector generation for then being able to streamline the manufacturing and the therapeutic gene expression so that we can reduce the number of empty capsids that are often associated with gene therapies. And that's what typically causes those immunogenic effects. So if we can reduce the empty capsids by enhancing the, the vector generation and the gene expression, then this will give us a, a leg up, so to speak, on the various uh, uh, flavors of the AAV types of uh, gene therapies that can be used for different organ systems. Um, we've also just released a playbook that serves as a guiding framework for the development and regulatory submission of AAV gene therapies for rare diseases. And this is really meant to serve as a one-stop shop for the roadmap for investigational new drug submissions for these innovative gene therapies. And it will ultimately include clinical quality attributes for the manufacturers. It will include how to do talk studies and other regulatory learnings as well. So um, this will be, I think, a, a, a program to continue watching if you're in the uh, the gene therapy space. We have initiated um, uh, the beginnings of our work to start to plan for clinical trials for eight different rare diseases within the BGTC program. Three of those are in the eye, three of those are uh, neurological diseases, and two of them are systemic diseases. So we'll be using three different flavors of the AAV vectors, again, to really highlight that this will be a good model for, um, uh, for enhancing that gene therapy approach for AAVs. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is, is called PAVGT. This is another collaboration we're doing with NHGRI, NINDS, and, and, and the Clinical Center. But our hypothesis here is that we want to uh, build a platform approach for uh, increasing the preclinical testing and clinical trial startup for gene therapies. And so we're looking at four diseases. Uh, two are organic acidemias, PCCA and MMAB. And then uh, two are congenital myasthenic syndromes, COL-Q and DOC7. And uh, these are our lead groups going forward now. Um, the PCCA is, is, is first on our docket, and it should uh, be probably in a clinical trial in about a year or so. So we're really on that path towards uh, clinical trial work. Um, so we're very excited about this. Um, the platform approach here is that we're using the same AAV, same manufacturing processes, same analytical methods, and same study designs to see if we can use that one vector with two different genes, but the same manufacturing processes for that vector to move that forward into clinical trial. That's the goal. 
Um, and, and I will say that this is a huge team effort, and it, I wanted to give a shout out to Chuck Venditti, who is in the NHGRI IRP, who's really been leading the first one out of the gate. So uh, uh, very excited about this program. One of the key features that I'm also very excited about, it's not as sexy, but I'm super excited about this. I think it will be the most impactful part of it is that we are publishing our orphan drug uh, designation templates and our rare pediatric disease designations um, that we have received from the FDA. A lot of times these are proprietary because companies are the ones filing them, so they don't share them. Um, we're the government and we work for you. So we wanna be able to share these. And so we have published a paper and I wanted to highlight that also uh, so you can take a look. All right, and then, and then lastly, just kind of pull it all together um, for these gene therapy programs in, in PAVDT. We're actually bringing in the 3D uh, tissue chip models, um, 3D bioprinted models. We've been able to take uh, patient iPS cells um, from the University of Pittsburgh and create liver spheroids, and then we're able to test the AAV viral uh, vector within that to do functional readouts. We're doing the same thing for the, uh, for the other neuromuscular junction diseases. Here we're using CRISPR edited iPS cells from NHLBI to create that, but then to test the functionality of uh, the AAVs for, the, for this work as well. Um, and since I'm talking about Rare Disease Day, I also can't go without mentioning that it is, uh, oh, upcoming is the Rare Disease Day at the NIH in 2024. It is the rarest of rare disease days because it's on the February 29th. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to, to, take, uh, to, to take in one of these meetings, um, they're extraordinarily special. Um, this time we're gonna be talking about artificial intelligence, um, recent approvals in gene therapy, and then we're, we'll have a lot of stories from patients and patient communities. So it's always a great time. So a uh, QR code is there for you to register. All right, now I want to wrap up uh, with talking a little bit about data science and um, AIML and, uh, as, as well as the CTSA program. But I'm going to start with, with the data science piece, um, and, and then I'll move into the other parts. Now, um, translator is it's called the um, NCATS Biomedical Data Translator. Uh, and do I admit the person into the room? No, you don't worry about it. Okay, I don't have to worry. Okay, good. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so uh, the translator is something that connects and integrates the uh, very diverse uh, biomedical data from a variety of trusted sources. I, and by a variety, I mean like over 150 uh, trusted sources. That's a lot of data. Um, and then it uses this advanced reasoning, AIML, to deliver uh, essentially evidence-based knowledge graphs to help us identify some unique features out of the data that maybe we haven't uh, been able to identify before. So you can ask questions like, hey, translator, uh, find chemicals that regulate a particular gene, um, or you can say, find genes that regulate a particular chemical, and so it will do its thing, it'll go into all these different databases, and I, I just wanted to show this slide because it highlights a variety of genomics databases that we have in there, but it also includes the NHGRI's Association to Function Knowledge Portal, and right before the talk, I learned about the IGVF, um, and I found out that it is now being incorporated into Translator as well, so I'm super excited. Um, we're, we're finger on the pulse with, uh, with the genomics work that's going on here, because I think that we'll be, uh, the more data we have, the more power we have underneath this. But let me tell you a little bit about that power. So uh, one of the questions was, uh, we, we had physicians come to us who were treating patients with something called the Shine Syndrome, uh, named for its symptoms that are shown, shown here. Um, and it's caused by mutations in the DLG4 gene that uh, uh, result in a loss of function. And so the translator team was especially hoping for a compound that could upregulate DLG4 in order to compensate for that loss of function. And uh, over the course of this uh, query, translator returned many potential treatments. But based on the doctor's review of the report, um, one of the, one of the uh, results stood out, and this was something called guanfacine. This is a blood pressure medication that's relatively safe. Um, and knowing the, the, the patient and the, and the drug and how it might work, they thought this might be a, a something worth trying. And so after approximately five months, the patient showed measurable improvement in both motor and behavioral skills. Um, the patient's mother actually sent in some images of her coloring books before treatment. So you can see the coloring work that's shown here. It's, it's a bit erratic outside of the lines. Um, and uh, however, after treatment with guanfacine, uh, the, the, the mother stated, we've seen a huge improvement in Peppa Pig. 
And so uh, I don't know that there are any much more inspiring words than that. Uh, we were super excited to see an improvement in Peppa Pig. If you're interested in learning about Translator, I don't have, the QR code doesn't work. You have to use the actual website, so it's shown here at the bottom. Um, but if you're interested in taking a look at it as well and, and trying the demo, uh, please do. But this really shows the value for all research stages and how they can work and identify perhaps new therapies that might already be existing um, in, the, in the data out there and how we could apply them to rare diseases. Now, um, I'm gonna end on a, a little bit of work that we're doing in the CTSA program. There's a, a ton of work going on in this, in this program. It's a flagship program at the NIH, and um, it is uh, uh, over 60 different academic medical organizations across the country. Um, and it, essentially, um, they have these local strengths. They're building infrastructure. Um, they, uh, uh, they're uh, training the next generation. They're working to meet urgent needs out in their communities. And so they've worked with HEAL, they've worked with uh, active programs, they work in telehealth and telemedicine, community engagement. All of these things um, are, are areas that they've supported. And um, they've also done a lot, quite a number of work in rare diseases and in genomics. And so I wanted to highlight a few of these features. They have, the, the CTSAs have been the go-to, I think, for the pandemic. Um, there have been so many efforts across the NIH that are, I think, just incredibly stellar. And the CTSAs have, have, because of how they operate and how they work across the country, they've been able to work across all of these different programs that have been supported by the NIH. Um, and the active clinical trials, for example, the vaccine trials, the RADx program, um, the, under, the SEAL underserved populations program, uh, the clinical informatics work that has been done. So I just want to jump into some of the highlights here. Um, one is, is called the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. This is essentially a, a, an electronic health record database that also brings in, through privacy-preserving linkage uh, records, it brings in um, CMS data, vaccine data, viral variant sequencing data, and the data are updated every two weeks. But in addition to those uh, sort of uh, more known data sets that we have, there are also about 70 other publicly uh, available data sets that we bring in as well. Social determinants of health, for example, is one of them. Um, and so there's a variety of information that we can really pull together here. We have 83 sites now uh, with over 20 million uh, records uh, in the database. Over 8.6 million of those are COVID positive, so it's a very rich set of data for uh, specifically questions around COVID and long COVID. If you're interested in taking a look here, the QR code is here. And there are a variety of dashboards and you can kind of look at the data that, that are there and a number of the publications that have come out. But I wanna give you a look of sort of how we built this. It, it's the, the life cycle of the electronic health record from any individual institution is highly varied as you, as you know, so bringing um, electronic health records in to be able to compare an apples to apples way was really challenging. So what we have done is we've centralized that effort. Um, so the institutions will send us their, uh, their data on a two week cadence, essentially. Um, we, and we take their phenotype and their data acquisition. We ingest that into our, our cloud-based uh, environment where we then um, do the, uh, the, the, the uh, ETL, of mapping those on to the OMOP, uh, the final sort of OMOP common data model. And then we serve that up to the public where really we have a, a, a robust analytics and collaborative support program here to, to do a lot of the research efforts. So all of the tools are in one place, people can collaborate in this environment, et cetera. So this has been really valuable, I think, for the community, for, for people interested in COVID. Um, as I mentioned, it brings in a lot of different data because EHRs are very messy. Uh, they, are, they miss a lot of, of information. So bringing in these data helps us bring the, the puzzle of any one person together in a de-identified way. And it's enabled us to understand if there's patient duplication, um, maybe find other data set linkages that we could pull in or identify people within cohorts for future studies as well. And we've done a lot of this work in collaboration with, with all of us. Um, and N3C is now part of the NAIR pilot. This is the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource Pilot that was launched earlier this year uh, to allow more people access to a variety of AI-related resources. So N3C is now amongst that NAIR pilot. Um, 
Some of the questions that, that we can answer through N3C, um, I just wanted to highlight as well. I, want, I have two sort of uh, ways of showing this. We received a call from Ashish Jha, who was the COVID uh, response team coordinator out of the White House um, earlier last year. Um, and he said, hey, if you guys can look at the number of people who were eligible for Paxlovid but didn't actually get prescribed Paxlovid or didn't take it, we'd like to know how many lives that would have saved from hospitalization or even mortality. So we took a look at the data and sure enough, we were able to identify this. And so over the course of the pandemic, when it started, when Paxlovid was first authorized, there was very low uptake, but then over the course, there was a little bit more uptake. But you can see that there are still uh, regions of the country that are quite low in terms of that uptake. And so here just shows the uptake uh, across the different groups that we're, we're working with. And on average, it's about 15 to 20% uptake in terms of Paxlovid use. Um, unfortunately, uh, what, what this means then is based on the time to event, so the time to somebody being hospitalized or, or dying from COVID, if Paxlovid uptake could have achieved even at the 50% rate, um, for that presumably eligible population from the time of its authorization through February 2023 when we did this analysis, we could have saved approximately 48,000 deaths and 135,000 hospitalizations. So this is the kind of public health information that we think is really important to continue to do this kind of work. Now the second piece of, of a sort of um, uh, data that we're working towards is that because we're still involved in the active program and still undergoing clinical trials through Active 6. This is the decentralized trial arm of Active. And so we have one more trial that's ongoing, and this is looking at metformin. It turns out that some studies have shown that metformin actually seems to uh, uh, prevent some of the severe complications of COVID and even prevent long COVID. But they've been done in quite small studies. So we're actually doing this in a, in a randomized clinical trial through Active 6, looking at 3,000 participants for six months after metformin treatment and looking at their uh, symptoms as well uh, for COVID, a 28-day uh, uh, um, endpoint that I mentioned before. And then, um, and then also we'll be looking at, their, at, at long COVID as well. Now, in addition to this, we're also looking at the N3C database to do a trial emulation study. So we're looking at all the people who, are, who had a COVID positive test and who then were prescribed metformin. And it turns out we have 110,000 people who meet these criteria right now. And so we're studying them as in parallel as we're studying the active six randomized trials. So this is going to be a great way to understand how trial emulations can work just using completely electronic health record data, as well as the randomized clinical trials. Nothing's going to beat the randomized clinical trials, I will tell you that. But this will help us understand the confidence levels that we can have in using these kinds of databases to help us study and learn more about um, uh, and perhaps even do a better job um, finding eligible patients, et cetera, for clinical trials. Um, now, when we get into genomics, I also wanted to highlight a few other um, uh, examples of collaborative efforts in the CTSA program with genomics in particular. Um, many of you probably are familiar with Robert Green's uh, BabySeq, the other Green, I guess, um, BabySeq. And uh, the, for, for the program here, um, we're supporting this, this work that on a, on a randomized clinical trial on the impact of whole genome sequency, sequ sequencing in ethnically and racially diverse populations of healthy infants. And this is to help us develop and implement and then evaluate the, the plans to really incorporate that genomic sequencing in underserved communities and how, to, how this can be more routine in that primary care setting. So this is an important program, I think, for all of us. And then on the other side, um, this is uh, work done by Ken Mandel and his colleagues at, at Harvard. Um, and um, this is uh, the Genomics Information Commons. It's the only data commons which has EHR data, uh, genomic data, and phenotypic data, along with biospecimen data that you can access and do uh, analyses at scale. So this is another program that I wanted to highlight and mention. Um, because I talked so much about rare diseases, I think this is an important one as well. And, and Eric had mentioned some in, in his director's report that was very similar to this. Um, but the idea of doing early, or what we call early check in the CTSA um, uh, study that is being supported, this is a collaborative innovation to, to facilitate um, looking at, at pre-symptomatic clinical trials in newborns. And so early check is in North Carolina. It offers free screening to detect rare conditions in, in uh, very early in, in children, and by, it's all vo volunteer. Uh, you can get the newborn screening program 
that is typical in North Carolina, or you can actually uh, augment that with other gene targeted diseases as well. And those will, those would be those genes uh, for those specific diseases would be sequenced. So we've sequenced now over 10,000 babies um, with families joining virtually and provided uh, results back to them. And so thanks to this particular program in the state of North Carolina, Fragile X and SMA are now part of North Carolina's standard newborn screening approach. And so we hope that this is um, an example of how we can continue to expand the newborn screenings um, across the country in more robust ways. Um, and then I'm going to end on this, this uh, particular um, vignette here, I guess. Um, this is done out of uh, the Scripps Translational Science Institute along with the Rady Children's Hospital, um, really showing the power uh, and the diagnostic power, the healing power of genomics. Um, a five-week-old uh, came into the ER, um, previously healthy, was admitted two hours after inconsolable atypical crying and irritability. And the examination of this child, they, they noticed that when, when they were crying, there was a downward eye deviation. And so they did a CT scan and they showed that there was these bilateral hypodensities in, in his brain. And so uh, it turns out that infantile encephalopathy is uh, quite a common uh, syndrome with approximately 1,500 of these that are, that are out there. And many of these have, are really clinically indistinguishable. So really the only path forward is to do genome sequencing. So they initiated genome sequencing uh, 13 hours uh, after they were in the, in the clinic or in the ER, and then had results um, uh, about a day later. And they found that this trial had thiamine metab metabolism dysfunction syndrome 2, and uh, that is very treatable. So thiamine and biotin were administered uh, about 36 hours after admission, and six hours later, the patient was alert, calm, and bottle feeding. So easy, um, actually, treatment for this child, luckily, in this case. But this is where we get the inspiration and the motivation to continue all of the work that we're doing in, in genomics and medicine uh, because it's so powerful. Um, so that, I'm, I'm going to end there. I'm just going to show this slide. We're doing a, a strategic plan. If you're interested in, in learning more about our strategic plan, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we've already heard from a variety of our NHDRI colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we've had a variety of roundtable discussions with our community, um, but we're looking forward to rolling this out in May, so please stay tuned to the work we're doing. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Joni. I'm, I'm looking at council members to raise their hand. I, I just want to make one point about your tissue chip and your collaboration with NASA. Um, uh, that last week at the AGBT meeting in Orlando, uh, there were several of us there, including yep. council members Len Panakia and Gal Jarvik, and Kate Rubens, who's a great, um, uh, great genomics scientist in her own right, as well as astronaut, as you well know. Yep. Uh, she, among her, she gave a dazzling talk, but she showed and um, some of the tissue chip work that she's doing, and gave a very nice shout out to NCATS. All right. So it was, was clearly well recognized. Though exactly what I knew exactly what you were talking about based on what Kate talked about last week. Um, Iftikhar. Uh, uh, thank you. That, that was just a wonderful presentation. Very inspiring, and really enjoyed that. Um, I, as you were speaking, I couldn't uh, help but uh, think about the many synergies. The, NCATS has with NHGRI, and there's so many <clears throat> opportunities for synergy. I'm sure that uh, that's a topic of discussion between me and Eric all the time. But one of the things that is a limitation uh, in genomics is uh, clinical trials. Drug trials are often funded by big money, big pharma. Mm -hmm. But it's hard, hard to do trials of genomic testing, whether it's polygenic risk scores or <clears throat> exome sequencing at scale. And I know that you, there is a trial innovation network in NCATS, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether there are some, um, there could be some uh, uh, collaboration or some uh, innovations that would allow <clears throat> such clinical trials to be less expensive, you know, using things like uh, REDCap or uh, uh, geofencing and, and some uh, other uh, innovations that are now possible, EHR linkage, uh, that would be a huge uh, uh, boon to, the, to, to this area of uh, clinical trials of genomic testing. Uh, uh, 
1,000 times yes, absolutely. All of those are possible. And the Trial Innovation Network is, is, um, is small but mighty. Um, one of the things that it does is it, um, it, it, whenever we're thinking about a clinical trial, now, now I, should, I should tell you a, a little known fact about NCATs and clinical trials. We're actually prohibited by law from, from actually doing phase three clinical trials um, unless we have uh, um, a, um, it's in the, we have to put it in the, in the guide um, let's not get the guide though. It's, it's the, it's something else. Um, but it's the, um, it, we have to make sure it's a public available source that people know that we're thinking about a clinical trial. So anytime we're doing a phase three clinical trial, we, we have to stop and do that, uh, period of 45 days to 60 days in, in that notice. Um, and then if we're okay from that point to proceed, then we, then we will, um, so a lot of the clinical trials we do are, we do of course phase one and phase two clinical trials, especially when it came to, um, to, uh, to COVID, but we also do a lot of these sort of comparative effectiveness and, and methodology development clinical trials. And so I think one of the things that, that you've pointed out too is things like looking at polygenic risk scores um, and how we can align um, information like that with EHRs. I think we have the power really to, to, to take this to the next level. And certainly, uh, we have partnered with NH uh, uh, LBI. Uh, they're wonderful partners to work with and have an incredible resource, TopMed, um, BioData Catalyst. We're working with them as well on N3C. So there's a variety of opportunities, I think, for us to connect in this front. And, and um, I, 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 more ideas we have, like what you're talking about, Iftikhar, that would be, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Judy? Yeah, no, that. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to look on the NCATS website with respect to some of these vectors and delivery approaches. Uh, my question has to do with um, kind of general themes of like rare diseases, the pediatric conceptions, and what, but generally when you intervene um, mm -hmm. in the disease process and the challenges of chronicity of disease, it's fundamental in autoimmunity, fundamental in Alzheimer's, like how do we, in, in, in your comment that obviously randomized controlled trials are the answer. So when you think about those 10,000 diseases, how are you thinking systematically about categorizing this in time to intervention? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. I don't know that I have a good answer, Judy, but, but I will say that a couple of things that we're thinking about for this is number one, thinking about, um, uh, first of all, getting more uh, rare diseases recognized in the electronic health record to, as a start to identify rare disease patients because that is a bottleneck too, is to have enough patients to do clinical trials. Um, sometimes we may not be able to get anything approved because we don't have enough numbers really. And that isn't necessarily a worry for me because if we can still get the, the treatment to patients, um, even if it's, if it's not sort of an NDA approach, then, then that should be okay. Um, but of course, the other piece of it is um, in thinking about clinical trial design, um, a, a lot of times, we're, and the translator I think approach is, is really good for this, for thinking about repurposing or repositioning of medications that might be in early phase of development or even on the market already or even generic, um, we can think about doing basket trials. And so with basket trials, you, you take the, the therapy and you look at multiple different diseases. And so you may be able to start looking at that chronicity of the, um, uh, of the diseases for, for those different um, those different diseases within a basket trial to see how that medication might be effective or not. Um, so that might be one thing. The other thing I think is we're looking at it at a little bit of a, a higher level in working with how we address um, uh, the, the clinical trials themselves and ensuring that we bring the patient population in the age group that is necessary for the disease when we start to see symptoms of the disease. Um, we have learned that um, if, if you don't have patients early in the disease, you do clinical trials more typically on people who are later in the disease, and then FDA will approve the treatment for those people later in the disease and maybe not for earlier in the disease. So we're trying to work with the FDA to understand how we can ask the right questions um, to understand that particular nuance in, in rare diseases. In addition to that, I think that the same question needs to be applied to CMS. So will they approve, for example, a gene therapy that needs to be done in earlier patients who are 
maybe not even be may not be showing symptoms, but will have it has a disease that they they will get. Um, so these I think are are bigger questions for us that we're we're facing. But we have our our line of sight on really how we need to think about the questions that we ask the FDA and CMS um, in that sort of dual way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions from council members for Joni? Otherwise, just to, thank just you. Just to so let you know, there is applause and gratitude in the <laughs> chat. Lots, well. lots of chat stuff yeah. coming in. So thank you, Joni. That was wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you all. It's so nice to see uh, all of these familiar faces, too, on the screen. Now, I wasn't seeing the council members earlier, but now I see them. So it's nice to yep. see you all. All right. Back thank to you, Rudy. All right. We're going to adjourn for lunch now. Why don't we come back at uh, 1.10 East Coast time, okay? See you then. <laughs>